day once again, friends, and welcome to our series on Amazing Discoveries. Today, our topic is the wine of mystic Babylon. Here we see an artist's depiction of ancient Babylon. Yet, when we get to the book of Revelation, it picks up on this terminology and refers back and alludes back to ancient Babylon. In fact, if we are to understand the prophecies of Revelation, we need to take note of the many allusions to the Old Testament. And only when we weigh Scripture with Scripture will we understand the great prophecies of Revelation. And so let's go to the Old Testament, to a prophecy concerning Babylon. Jeremiah 51, verse 6 and 7. Flee from Babylon. Run for your lives. Do not be destroyed because of her sins. It is time for the Lord's vengeance. He will pay her what she deserves. Babylon was a gold cup in the Lord's hand. She made the whole earth drunk. The nations drank her wine. Therefore, they have now gone mad. In other words, the philosophies and ideologies of Babylon infiltrated the surrounding nations and they became drunk and intoxicated with these teachings. Here we have literal Babylon. It is local and it is geographically situated. But friends, when we speak about Babylon in prophecy in the book of Revelation, it now becomes universal. It is a spiritual concept. It becomes spiritual Babylon. In the book of Revelation, the church is represented by a woman. And I will give you evidence of this in a further lecture. The woman dressed in white and clothed with a sun represents the pure church. But the woman dressed in scarlet and bedecked with jewels, carrying the gold cup, she represents the fallen church, the apostate, unfaithful church. So the church is depicted as an adulterous woman who has not been faithful to her husband, Jesus Christ. The whole world becomes drunk because the wine has fermented. There is wine in that cup and it looks so attractive. It is golden and shiny, but it intoxicates the whole world. Fermented wine, friends, is a symbol of sin. In order to understand the concept of Babylon, we have to go way back to the Tower of Babel itself. Genesis 11, 7 to 9. And that is why it was called Babel. Because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. Bab El, Babel. Bab means portal and El means God. This is the portal to God. The way to God. That is what they believed. It was a system of trying to reach up to God through their own works. They weren't reaching God through the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. They were trying to reach God through their own works. So Babylon is a symbol of confusion, first of all, because the languages were confused there. And secondly, it is a symbol of salvation by man's own work. Now let's go across to Revelation 14, verse 8. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, because she made all nations drink of the wine of her fornication. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. So Babylon is going to be punished. 
And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils. They are evil spirits working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth, to the leaders of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. So friends, mystic spiritual Babylon has three components, as we've just read. There is the dragon, and we've now learned that the dragon is Satan himself. There is the beast, that is the Antichrist system, and there is the false prophet. We will unpack that symbol in a future presentation. Those are the three components of Babylon. We can refer to them as the pseudo-trinity. You see, the devil counterfeits everything. He also has a trinity. It is the pseudo-trinity. So modern-day Babylon or spiritual Babylon is the union of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, together with all the kings and political leaders of the earth. They form a major confederacy against God and against his people. Now friends, in today's presentation, we are going to look at how Babylonian principles, principles from Babylon of old, the old mystic religion of Babylon, have infiltrated right into the very church of God. So we need to carefully examine the contents of that golden cup that looks so attractive. You see, during the Middle Ages, the church and the state became united. And this is what led to the problems. Development of Christian Doctrine, page 372. We are told by Eusebius that Constantine, in order to recommend the new religion to the heathen, to the pagans, transferred into it the outward ornaments to which they, the pagans, had been accustomed in their own. So paganism slowly crept into the church. And the Bible warns us of this. In Acts 20 verse 39, Paul said, I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in amongst you and will not spare the flock. So within the church, we would have deception arising. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So Paul warned us that this would take place. Now friends, there is nothing worse than to believe sincerely that you are doing what is right and then to discover that you have actually been deceived. Now let's go way, way back to ancient Babylon, to Babel itself. The king of Babel was Nimrod. He was the first king of Babel. His wife was Semiramis or Ishtar. She claimed that when her husband died, that the gods of heaven revealed to her that her husband had become the sun god. And she said that her subjects were now to worship the sun god. It was he that brought light and warmth to the earth during the day. And at night he protected the people of the land from the demons of the underworld. Their beloved king, she said, was now serving them in a more exalted position as the sun god himself. And everyone was to bow down and worship the sun. So here we have the beginnings of sun worship in the ancient mystery religions. Ishtar, or Semiramis, suddenly became pregnant. And she made an amazing announcement that she had received a miraculous conception that she had been penetrated by a ray from her husband. 
the Son God. And because she had conceived by the Son God, her son, Tammuz, was to be worshipped as the Son of God. And because he was the Son of God, she was now the mother of God. And so we have the beginnings of mother and son worship. And friends, this idea spread throughout the ancient world amongst all the ancient mystery religions. It spread to Egypt, where it was known as Isis and Osiris. Scandinavia, it was Frigga and Balda. In Rome, it was Venus and Adonis. In Babylon, it was Ishtar and Tammuz. In Phoenicia, it was Ashtoreth and Baal. Even Israel was influenced by these. In Greece, it was Ceres and Plutus. It spread across to the east, to India, where we have mother and child worship, Isi and Iswara. In China and Japan, it was Shingmu and her savior son. And so the mother figure was the wrath subduer and the one through whom you approached the deity, the sun god. So Ishtar became the queen of heaven. She was the intercessor through whom you approached the sun god. And through Baal worship, friends, Israel was influenced. Paganism, sun worship, and Baal worship infiltrated amongst God's people. We read about it in Ezekiel 8 verse 16. At the door of the temple of God, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men, with their backs towards the temple of God, and their faces towards the east, and they worshipped the sun towards the east. Can you believe it? That they had sunk so low, at the very sanctuary of God where they were to worship the true God. They had the, their backs to God's temple and they were worshipping the sun. Now, the name of the child is very significant. Tammuz was the name of the child of Ishtar. But the name had different connotations in different areas. For example, he was also known as Zoroaster, which means the seed of the woman. Tammuz means the heavenly shepherd. Mithras means the savior. Dionysus means the sin bearer. Bacchus, the branch. Vishnu, the victim man. And Osiris in Egypt means the king of kings. Can you see, friends, the devil knew. The devil knew. Do you notice, friends, that all these ancient religions steal the name of the true son of God and apply it to their religion? The devil knew. The devil did his best to deceive the world with counterfeits before the first advent of Jesus. Now, according to tradition, eventually Semiramis or Ishtar ascended into heaven to be crowned as queen of heaven, where she now became the intercessor between the sun god and man. Now, when this sun god was reincarnated and reborn through the woman. It was as if he plunged into the womb of the woman, represented by the waters of the Euphrates, where any suffering he could shelter as a fish. This is what they taught. And so we have the development of Dagon, the fish god. And he was worshipped as dug on, on, sun, God, and dug, a fish. So the God Dagon is the reincarnation 
of the sun deity. And to the left you see a picture of the ancient pagan priests of Baal. Please notice the mitre that they are wearing. The mitre of the fish. Here we have dug on the sunfish clearly displayed with a fish cape and mitre. This is in the Babylonian exhibit in the Pergamon Museum. I want you to notice the open mouth at the top of the head. Here we have it again. The priests performing their functions, spraying holy water in the Babylonian exhibit in the Pergamon Museum. Here's another depiction of these ancient priests wearing the fish mitre with the open mouth at the top. And friends, here we have bishops wearing the headdress of the sun god, Dagon. Have you ever wondered where this comes from? Well, now you know. It's traced back to the ancient pagan religions. Here we see the Pope himself with the mitre of Dagon, the fish god. We see it in the ancient Egyptian religion, where Osiris is wearing his mitre. Life of Constantine by Eusebius, in order to attach to Christianity great attraction in the eyes of the nobility, the priests adopted the outer garments and adornments which were used in pagan cults. You see, the Babylonian high priest was addressed as your holiness. He had the title Pontifex Maximus. His subjects had to bow down to him and kiss his ring. He was believed to be infallible. He was worshipped as a deity. He administered incense and holy water, and you can see this in this relief. He was the supreme ruler of the world, both religious and secular. And friends, those principles have infiltrated into modern day spiritual Babylon. Please notice right here we have a sun pillar. This is a symbol of worshipping the sun. As we enter into the foyer, of the Vatican, we see the papal ensign on the floor. Please notice the title Pontifex Maximus. Friends, this is the same title as the pagan Roman emperor who was believed to be the reincarnation of the sun god. Let's take a closer look at the papal ensign. I want you to notice the three-storied crown, the triple crown. Notice the keys crossing this enzyme. I want you to notice also the fleur de lis. I'll talk a bit about that later. But most important, I want you to notice the line with wings. Where have we seen that before? In ancient Babylon. The line with eagle's wings represents. Babylon. The Pope is given the same titles as the leaders of the ancient religions. Your Holiness, Pontifex Maximus. He was infallible. Subjects have to bow down and kiss his ring. He was worshipped as a deity. He administers incense and holy water. And he is the supreme ruler of the world. Here we have St. John's Lateran. This is the main church of Roman Catholicism. Let's enter this beautiful building. It really is quite stunning inside. It is here in this building that the Pope is crowned and where he is declared infallible. Here we show the papal coat of arms. It's found in the Basilica of St. John's Lateran. I'd like you to notice 
the keys of Peter. Are these really Peter's keys? Notice also the triple crown, by the way. Here we see the throne of St. Peter in the Vatican itself. Friends, did Peter really sit on a throne? Peter, who would who refused to be crucified like his Lord, he was crucified upside down. Would he really have sat on a golden throne? These are not the keys of Peter the Apostle. If we do some research, we will find that they really come from ancient Babylon. They come from the Babylonian line God. We, yeah, we see him holding the keys in his hands. They are the keys to heaven and to hell. It is he who decides who goes to heaven and who goes to hell. It reminds me of this statement which we looked at in an earlier presentation. God himself is obliged to abide by the judgment of his priests and either not to pardon or to pardon according as they refuse or give absolution. The sentence of the priest precedes and God subscribes to it. They hold the keys to heaven and to hell. Here yeah, on this ancient relief, we see the pontiff kings of Egypt and Babylon who were carried ceremoniously. The feathers represented the wings of the sun god. And here we see the modern king of Babylon also carried in a chariot. And on either side, we have the wings of the sun god. Friends, was Jesus ever carried around like this? Here we see the triple crown. And all the subjects of the Pope, the cardinals included, have to bow down in honor to him. Why? Because he is deity. He is his holiness. Is it any wonder that the Catholics have removed the second commandment from the Ten Commandments of God? Now, where does this triple crown come from? It represents the God of heaven, the earth, and the underworld, or the netherworld. Here we see the Babylonian God, 1800 BC. This is where it comes from. On the left, we have the horned tiara on an Assyrian winged bull. Also, note the triple crown. To the right, we have the same thing depicted in the Eastern religions. Here we have the mother and child. I want you to notice the halo behind the heads. Also notice the occult sign made with the fingers. The halo is really a representation of the sun. And it comes from the ancient sun worship, once again. Here we have mother and child worship. In the east, in India, and in China and Japan. Here we see it in Egypt. In Egypt we have Isis with Horus on the lap. And to the right, we have this equivalent in the Hittite culture. Here we see the same in the Aztec culture. Madonna and child, even in South America. And here we see some black Madonnas with their child. And so we see how this idea has infiltrated right around the world. In the New Catholic Encyclopedia, Volume 9, page 386, we read, Pius XII affirmed strongly the queenship of Mary, inserting in the calendar for May 31st a new feast of Mary Queen. Pius XII consecrated the world to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, Mother and Queen, October 31, 1942, as a public recognition of her queenship. So Mary is now Queen of Heaven, 
just like in the ancient Babylonian mystery religion where Ishtar became queen of heaven. Friends, these are Babylonian principles that have infiltrated into the very church of God. Here we see Mary as queen exactly the same as the pagan queen of heaven. And notice she's being adored by the disciples. Note in this statue who is wearing the crown and who has the scepter in her hand. Mary is regarded as the co-redemptrix and advocate of the people of God. Oh, my friends, there is only one redeemer. There is only one advocate that stands before God, and that is the man, Jesus Christ. But now, Mary is made co-redemptrix. Please notice, in this painting, the crown of thorns placed upon Mary's head. Please notice, the wounds in her hands. Here we see Mary crowned again by the Father and the Son. And below she is being worshipped. Catholicism teaches that nobody comes to the Father except through the Son. And nobody comes to the Son except through Mary. She becomes a co-redemptrix. Here once again we see Mary being crowned by the Father and and the son. And here once again she is being crowned and notice who is tramping on the serpent. Mary, not Jesus Christ. So Mary becomes a mediatrix. She becomes the queen of heaven and she is crowned by the Pope as such. Friends, my Bible tells me in 1 Timothy 2 verse 5, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Jesus Christ. Here we see a statue of Mary. The queen of heaven is standing on the serpent's head once again. But at the same time, she's feeding the serpent from her breast. According to scripture, who was to crush the head of the serpent? Jesus Christ. She is the one through whom the serpent is receiving life. Here we have the statue of Jesus. But actually, it's the statue of Tammuz. But they say it's baby Jesus. Friends, this is a pagan statue that was brought in and just simply rebaptized, coated with gold and with jewels, it is worth millions. And people believe that it represents Jesus Christ. And hordes of letters are sent to this statue every year asking for help. Here we have the stairs of La Santa Scala. These are the stairs, so it is said, that Jesus climbed when he was tried by Pilate and his blood dripped on the stairs. And one night, miraculously, these stairs were transported from Jerusalem to Rome and a whole church has been built around these stairs. Now, it is thought that if you climb these stairs and you say a prayer on every stair and you kiss the stairs, more particularly the places where the blood of Jesus dropped and they're covered with little glass uh, panels, then you will receive forgiveness or absolution in advance. So if you climb all the stairs, and you kiss every one of these little glass plates, you say a prayer on every stair, you will receive 30 or 90 days absolution. So for the next three months, you can live as you please, sin as much as you like, and you will be forgiven in advance. Friends, that is paganism. You will not find that in the Bible at all. 
Then we have beatification. Where people are made into saints. And they are worshipped and approached and are prayed to for help. But what does the scripture teach about worshipping the dead? God says it is an abomination to the Lord. Here is the church, the Capuchin church in Rome. Notice how this church has been decorated with relics. Skulls of previous worshippers. Everywhere you see the bones being used. Look at the ceiling. The way it has been decorated with the bones of the dead. Even the chandeliers have been made from clavicles and the humerus and the ulna and various parts of the body. Here we see relics of saints. We see sarcophagi and you may have relics uh, of the teeth or the hair or certain bones. And you can find intercession from whichever saint suits your fancy. The ancient cultures used to believe that when you die, your soul would go up and become one of the stars of heaven. And you can pray to your ancestors. Friends, in Africa, ancestors are brought to the mass and worshipped together with Jesus. This is paganism. When we come to the sacrifice of Jesus, Catechism of the Council of Trent, part 2, page 4, we read, The sacrifice of the Mass is and ought to be considered one and the same as that of the cross, as the victim is one and the same, namely Christ our Lord. In other words, friends, Every time we participate in communion or the Mass, as you say the magical words, or when the priest says the magical words, the bread and the wine mysteriously turn into the literal body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is what the Catholics believe. In Hebrews 6 verse 6, Paul says, They crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. You see, friends, Jesus died once and for all. In the Vatican Museum, you will see this statue. It is a statue of Jesus on the cross, but he's standing on the triple crown of the Pope and is being held up from below. In other words, he must stay on the cross. He must be crucified over and over again. Hebrews 10 verse 14. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Jesus was offered once and for all. But friends, the Catholics keep on holding him up on the cross. He is crucified over and over and over again at every single Mass, at every single cathedral around the world. Here we see the host. The host represents the victim or the sacrifice. Please notice its shape. Where does that come from? When we read the Bible, it says that Jesus broke the bread into pieces. But here we have the host. It, in fact, is a representation of the Son. The Bible nowhere speaks about a round wafer. The Lord took bread and broke it. In Babylon, Mystery Religion, Ancient and Modern, page 129, we read this about the host. The host, the word, comes from the Latin meaning the victim or sacrifice. Historian Bishop says, the round wafer whose roundness is so important in the Romish mystery is only another symbol of Baal or the sun. So there you have it. 
to the right, you see a little monstrance. And what they do, they take the host and they place it within that circle. And there's a little inscription below which says, fall on your knees because you are in front of God. Let's go back to the ancient cultures, to the ancient mystery religions. Here we see an Assyrian style relief of King Bar Rakar from Syria, that is from the 8th century BC. I'd like you to notice the sun disk plunging into the crescent moon. Here we have a solar deity, and it's known as Baal Hadad. It's shown as a disk inside the crescent. It represents the reincarnation of the sun god in the womb of the woman. And friends, you will find this symbol throughout the ancient pagan mystery religions. You can see it here in these two slides. The one on the left is from Assyria. The one on the right is from ancient Egypt. Here we see it in the Hittite culture, the sun plunging into the crescent moon. To the left you see it in Egypt, and to the right you see it in a Catholic cathedral. Now in the High Mass, the Pope holds the host, the victim, and then it is placed in a monstrance or an ostensorium as it is called. So here we have a Roman ostensorium or monstrance used for the elevation of the host. It is one of the ritualistic tools in ancient sun worship. Here we see another monstrance. The host is placed inside that circular disc, just above the little crescent moon that you see there. It's a pagan symbol, friends. It represents the sun god being reincarnated. Below that you see the letters SFS. Now the letter S is the sixth letter of the ancient Greek alphabet. And the letter F is the sixth letter of the modern alphabet. And so cryptically here, we have the letters 6, or the numbers 666. Six, six. And below it, we have the Sacred Heart, which, by the way, is also an ancient pagan symbol, referring back to the ancient pagan sacrifices. Here we see the sun disk behind the cross of Jesus. We have Christianity and paganism combined. And out of the sun disk, we have rays emanating. Some of the rays are straight, and some of them are wavy. The straight rays represent the male. The wavy lines represent the female, or the snake. And so here we have male-female union. Uh, it's a reference back to the fertility cults of the ancient pagan religion. Here we see another monstrance in which the host is placed. Notice again, you place the round wafer above the crescent moon. It's a symbol of Baal Hadad. And it's right here within the Catholic Church. When you look at some of the other pagan religions, for example, Mithra, from the Persian religion, he was also worshipped by eating the round wafer or the round bread. The Egyptian sun god Osiris and later Serapis, god of the dead, were eaten in the form of a round disc wafer, a symbol of the sun. Can you see, friends, how these ancient pagan mystery religions have infiltrated into the church. Here we see the reverse side 
of a papal medal minted by Pius XI in 1929. Notice the sunburst wafer of the Eucharist appearing above St. Peter's Basilica and the cup of the Mass. Clearly influenced by sun worship. Here is a Catholic church in Germany and notice the symbol of Baal Hadad on the clock. Every hour you have Baal Hadad, Baal Hadad, Baal Hadad. Here again we see the sun disk descending into the crescent moon. And in the center we have Jesus and we have Mary. Mary holding baby Jesus, once again standing in the crescent moon. And notice the straight and wavy lines emanating from the sun disk behind. Here again in this artwork, we see Mary with baby Jesus in the crescent moon. Here again, we see the same thing. And then of course, as we've discussed before, we have Sunday worship. Sunday worship, friends, comes from paganism. Sunday being the day on which the Gentiles solemnly adored the sun. The Christians thought fit to keep the same day and the same name of it, that they might not appear causelessly peevish, and by that means hinder the conversion of the Gentiles. You see, it's compromise. Oh, we, we don't want to hinder the the, the pagans coming into the church. So let's, well, you know, let's worship on Sunday. Let's worship on the same day that they worship. Webster's Dictionary, 1929. Sunday, so called because this day was anciently dedicated to the sun or to its worship. The first day of the week. The Catholic World, March 1994, page 809. The sun was a foremost god with heathendom. There is, in truth, something royal, kingly about the sun, making it a fit emblem of Jesus, the son of righteousness. Hence the church in these countries would seem to have said, keep that old pagan name. It shall remain consecrated, sanctified. And thus the pagan Sunday, dedicated to Balder, became the Christian Sunday, sacred to Jesus. Here we see an ancient Mesopotamian cylinder and on it you will see the sun represented as a cross in the sky. So the cross is also, or the Maltese cross, is a symbol of the sun god. Here we see it. It's one of the oldest pictures in the world from Mesopotamia and the sun is represented as a cross. Here we see the face of the child within the fertility symbol of the sun's rays on a Roman Catholic altar. It's really the face of Apollo. Here we see the face of Apollo, the Greek sun god. This is on the temple of Apollo at the Pergamon Museum. And here we have the face of Apollo, the sun god, on top of, of one of the serpentine pillars on Bernini's canopy in St. Peter's Basilica in the Vatican. Friends, what is an ancient pagan symbol doing in a Christian church? Here we see it at, at the top of one of the other columns within St. Peter's. Here we see the face in the sun disk on a pulpit of a church in Scandinavia. And here we have one of the Japanese gods of happiness. I want you to notice once again the halo behind his head. So this eventually infiltrated right across to Japan. There too we have the symbols of sun worship. Here we see Krishna, a Hindu deity. Once again, notice the sun disk behind his head. Here we have Buddha. Once again, notice the sun disks behind his head. And here we have the sun disk 
behind a priest in a Catholic cathedral. I want you to also notice the crook. It's in the shape of a serpent. Friends, here we have the woman holding a lightning bolt in her hand. This statue is found in a Jesuit cathedral. This statue reveals the aim of the Jesuit movement to suppress the work of the reformers. The woman, the Catholic Church, is treading underfoot Luther and Huss. And then if you look towards the lower left, you'll see a little cherub. And this close-up shows the cherub tearing out the pages of the Bible which Luther translated in the common language of the German people. What is this lightning bolt doing in Mary's hand? Where does this come from? Well, friends, it comes from the other ancient pagan religions. Here we see the god Zeus holding the lightning bolt in his hand. There are many, many statues within Roman Catholicism that come from pagans and they've simply been brought in and rebaptized. For example, here we have the statue of Jupiter, a pagan god brought into the Vatican and rebaptized as Peter. Notice the sun disk above his head. Notice the occult sign that he's showing with his hand. So a pagan statue has simply been rebaptized and people worship it. The statue of Peter has been kissed millions and millions of times. So much so that the toes have been worn right down, as you can see in this slide. Here we see the ancient trident. Now Baal, Neptune, Poseidon, and other gods of storm and sea were depicted as carrying tridents, symbolic of lightning. The wavy lines represent the female and were associated with the serpent. The straight line is male, representing the phallus. Thus, this symbol represents male and female union. Friends, here we see the trident in the ancient Hittite culture. Here we see Poseidon or Neptune, ruler of the sea or underworld, holding his trident, traceable to the horned, hoofed sun god of Babylon, who also carried the trident. Here we see the trident in the Hindu religion, Shiva here is holding the trident in her hand. And here, friends, we see the trident in St. Paul's Cathedral in London. Let's go a little closer. There you can see the tridents emanating from the cross. Here we see the tridents on the head of Jesus, baby Jesus. So we have Mary and baby Jesus displaying these ancient pagan symbols. Here we have the fleur de lis in the Roman Catholic Church. Here we have the fleur de lis on the winged god of Babylon, the top of his head. And to the right, we have the fleur de lis on Isis, the goddess of the Egyptians. And here we have the fleur de lis emanating from the head of Christ in a Catholic cathedral. Friends, this is a symbol of Baal worship. It's arranged the same way as in the ancient pagan mysteries. What about the rosary or the prayer beads? Well, this also comes from the ancient mystery religions. When you use the rosary, you will have ten Hail Marys and one Hail Father. And the prayers become very repetitive. But Jesus said, when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. For they think they shall be heard.
for their much speaking. Here we see the beaded prayer circle of the pagan priests in ancient Mesopotamia. They are praying with beads. And here you have it in the ancient Hindu religion. Then we have the eye of Osiris. The eye of Osiris seen in the lower left comes from Egypt. The so-called all-seeing eye. Friends, today the all-seeing eye is used as a symbol both by the New Ages and by the Freemasons. Here we see the all-seeing eye in the center of a sexagesimal triangle. A sexagesimal triangle is a triangle with 60, 60, 60 degrees. In other words, 6, 6, 6. Here we see the sexagesimal triangle with the all-seeing eye in a Roman Catholic pulpit in Paris. Here we see it on a confessional in the Cathedral of Milan. Notice also the rays emanating from the triangle. That represents the rays of the sun. And here we see it right at the top of the photograph on the main window of a Catholic cathedral. Here it is at the top of a sun pillar at a Jesuit college. Friends, these symbols are pagan. They originate with the ancient pagan mystery religions. Then we have the globe. Here we see the Persian sun god Mithra holding the globe in his right hand. That globe is a symbol of rulership of the universe. Here we see the statue of a Romanized Egyptian, Isis, holding the globe in her hand. And here is the globe at the top of St. Peter's Basilica. That globe is so big, I am told that eight people can sit inside of it. And here we see the globe being held by Jesus in a Catholic cathedral. I want you to notice once again the occult sign made by the right hand. Here we have Tammuz making the occult sign with his right hand. And friends, here we have the sun disk at the main altar in St. Peter's. And many, many of the pagan signs that I have discussed can be seen on the floor of St. Peter's. Friends, here is the seat of modern-day spiritual Babylon. There are also symbols of fertility that come from the ancient pagan religions. Here we have the Babylonian god with a pine cone in his hand. The pine cone is a symbol of pagan fertility. Here we see the pine cone staff symbol of Osiris in the Egyptian Museum in Torino, Italy. Yeah, we have the pine cone, a common symbol on images of the Hindu gods in India. Yeah, we have Dionysus, the Greek god, carrying the pine cone staff as a fertility symbol. The pine cones and pine cone staffs are very common on pagan statues and art as symbols of fertility and regeneration. Here we have Bacchus, the Roman Greek god of drunkenness and revelry, holding the pine cone staff. And friends, here we have Pope John Paul II holding the pine cone staff. The Pope is the bishop of modern-day spiritual Babylon. And here, in the court of the pine cone, at the Vatican, we have the largest pine cone in the world. And so, friends, we have modern-day Pontifex Maximus, the king of modern-day spiritual Babylon. What about the winged serpent in Egypt? This is a very common symbol 
in ancient Egypt. The serpent was an important symbol in the ancient pagan religions, often seen as a symbol of life and of healing. Here we see the winged serpent guarding King Tutankhamun's throne. And notice the serpent is depicted with wings once again. Here we see it up close. The serpent with his wings protecting the king. Yeah, on King Tutankhamun's death mask, once again we have the cobra, the serpent. It was an object of worship in ancient Egypt. Here we see the serpent in Hinduism. And here we see the serpent in Buddhism. Buddha himself meditating and guarded by Naga, the serpent. The serpent was said to have had certain healing powers. And so we find it, for example, at the Roman baths in England. And at the bottom, we have the serpent dragon door handle at St. Mary's Cathedral in San Francisco. Here we have the tiara of Pope Sixtus with six serpents beneath an occult pyramid. Friends, what are these pagan symbols and the symbol of Satan himself doing within the Christian church? The crossed keys were symbols of pagan Rome. Here we see it on an ancient bridge in Rome. And so was the dragon. It was a symbol often used in pagan Rome. And here we have the dragon on the papal crest in the Vatican Museum. The very word vatus means diviner and khan, serpent. So Vatican, divining serpent. Friends, here we see dragons displayed at the Vatican, some in the crests of the popes. If you look at the slide on the left, you will see the serpent at the bottom, and above that, the keys of Peter and the triple crown. Also, if you go across to the right-hand side, once again, you see the serpent at the bottom, the keys of Peter, and at the top, the triple crown. And here we have the largest serpents in the world, the serpentine pillars at St. Benini's Column, the altar in St. Peter's, the Vatican. The dragon has his seat in the Vatican. And the entire world has become drunk with its wine, with its ideologies, its teachings. Here's another look at St. Benini's column. At the top, you have the golden globe once again. And at the top of the pillars, you have the face of Apollo, the sun god. At the bottom you will see a carving of Pope Joan giving birth. This was a female pope. She hid it very well until one day she gave birth during a procession. You would think they'd hide it, but they make it their boast. Here we have, in the ancient pagan religions, the serpent being carried as a staff. And here we have the serpent croziers that were commonly carried by bishops during the Middle Ages. And then finally, friends, we have the pagan solar wheel, a typical symbol from the ancient mystery religions. Here we have the Babylonian sun god Shamash and the altar in front of him with the wheel of the sun. Here we have the solar wheel over the entrance to a Buddhist temple in Thailand. It has infiltrated all of these religions. Here we have it behind the statue of Buddha. Here we have a bronze ornament representing the eye of Osiris with a solar wheel at its base. So this is found in Egypt as well. And here we have the solar wheel at the temple of Kararak in India. And here we have the solar wheel at 
Pergamum, ancient Pergamum, which the Bible calls the seat of Satan. The El Hermana letters abound with phrases such as, My Lord, the Son, the Son God, my Lord, or the King, my Lord, the Son from heaven. All pointing back to ancient sun worship. Here we have the pagan sun wheel of the year, and this is revered by the Wiccan witches. Here we have the sun wheel at St. George's Catholic Church. Here it is at Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. And here we have it on the ceiling of St. Ignatius Loyola Monastery in Spain. Here we have a Roman Catholic painting of Madonna holding the solar wheel, which is a symbol of power and fertility. And friends, here we have one of the largest solar wheels of all. The solar wheel at the Vatican. And right in the center, we have a pagan symbol to the sun. What are these pagan symbols doing within the Christian church? You see, paganism over centuries has been subtly taken up into the system. Within the beast system, we find the purest Babylonian principles dressed up in a cloak of Christianity, nicely packaged and sold to the world in an attractive golden cup. And the world is told to drink the real wine when in fact it is the wine of fornication. All of it has its origins in sun worship. All of it originates in the ancient pagan mystery religions, the religion of Babylon and Egypt. And from there it spread to all the other religions of the world. Yeah, from the book, The Story of American Catholicism, page 37, the Catholics actually boast of the fact that they have taken paganism into their system. It has been charged that Catholicism is overlaid with many pagan incrustations. Catholicism is ready to accept that accusation and even to make it her boast. The great God Pan is not really dead. He is baptized. What a frank confession. And so, friends, in the book of Revelation, God speaks out against compromised Christianity. And he exposes her fall from grace and warns of her ultimate punishment. You see, that is why the woman dressed in scarlet and bedecked with jewels is represented as a harlot, as a prostitute. She has been unfaithful to her husband, Jesus Christ. So here is the seat of modern day Babylon. It is a system of confusion. A confused mixture of Christianity and ancient paganism. And secondly, it is a system of salvation by one's own works. For more than a thousand years, she was the bride of Christ. And let me just stop there, friends. I want to emphasize this. For a thousand years, the Roman Catholic Church was the only church. She was the bride of Christ. But she compromised. She became corrupt and she apostatized. Because of her unfaithfulness, God depicts her as a prostitute who has fallen from grace. Having committed fornication with the kings and the leaders of the earth, she has imbibed their false philosophies, their ideologies, and their pagan practices. 
And friend, if you accept any of her intoxicating wine, that is her false teachings, you become part of the Babylonian system. And if Protestantism had to go back to Rome and acknowledge the Pope as the spiritual leader of the world, what would it be doing? It would be returning to paganism. And friends, I will show you in a future presentation that that is what is happening in our modern world. You see, the prophecy says in Revelation 13 verse 3 that all the world wandered after the beast. And power was given him, that is the beast, over all kindreds and tongues and nations. It is Satan that gives the beast its power over the nations. And that is why, dear friends, God gives us a warning in the book of Revelation. Revelation 18 verse 4. Come out of her. That is, come out of Babylon. My people. So where are most of God's people? They're still in Babylon. And God says, come out of her. Come out of this false, confused system of worship. Come out out of her, my people, that he be not partakers of her sins, and that he receive not of her plagues. And so, friends, it is my prayer that you will say with Joshua, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Shall we pray together? O oh, gracious Father, today we have seen and exposed the system of modern, modern day spiritual Babylon. Father, this has not been easy for me to do. But your word is very clear on this matter. Babylon will exist within the last days. And you are calling your people out of this false system of worship. You are calling them to follow Jesus, to follow His commandments, to be loyal and faithful to Jesus alone. O oh God, help us to hear your voice and to follow you. This is my prayer. In Jesus' name, Amen.